Hey friends, I want to thank our sponsor, Raygun. Are you struggling to replicate the bugs and performance issues that your customers are reporting? Plug Raygun into your web and mobile applications right now and diagnose problems in minutes rather than hours. Kiss goodbye having to dig through log files and relying on frustrated users to report issues. Make your software development life so much easier using Raygun's error, crash, and performance monitoring tools. Every software team can create flawless software experiences for their customers with Raygun. Try it free today at raygun.com. That's R-A-Y-G-U-N dot com. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Matthew Conlon. He's a PhD student interested in how computers can help people communicate complex information more effectively and the editor-in-chief of Parametric Press. How are you, sir? I'm great, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. It is absolutely my pleasure. I've been trying to get you on the show for a while because I I stumbled upon you on the internet. You know, every day we see interesting stuff and there's lots of interesting people, but every once in a while you find an interesting person that you then kind of start following around. Like uh, I was f- seeing, oh wow, he worked on this and then he worked on that and oh that's interesting. I got to know who this this Matthew Conlon is. And the first time I I heard of the work that you were working on was at this, uh, this parametric press, it's parametric dot press kudos for the top level domain there. Uh, thank you. Unraveling the JPEG article that kind of went low key viral. I think it was on hacker news for a while, but it was just everywhere. Everyone was talking about this article that Omar Shahada did called unraveling the JPEG hosted on your, on your site. What is it that that captured the imagination of the internet with this article? Yeah, so this article walks readers through the technology that makes uh, JPEGs possible on the internet. So I think one thing with the article is that, you know, it's covering a topic that everyone who uses computers or the internet is familiar with, which is JPEG images and how they can let us send cat pictures to one another. Um, But the way that Omar presented the information was kind of really special and really interesting. Um, So rather than just talking about the technology and showing kind of static diagrams and equations, um, he built these interactive diagrams that would allow readers to actually manipulate the bits that make up the image and see how, you know, changing different pieces of information actually affect how the image is encoded and how it appears on the screen. Mm -hmm. So that's something that, you know, the internet is a great medium to be able to create interactive things like this. And uh, it, it doesn't happen so often that uh, you get someone who's so knowledgeable and passionate as Omar, who's able to create something like that and share it with so many people. Indeed. When, when I first arrived at this page, as we all have a half dozen long form articles that we're, we promise ourselves that we'll read that, you know, that come at us all year, all year long, every day. Uh, I thought, oh, well, this is like a medium a medium post. And by medium, I mean, nice typography, clean use of white space, but it's got dramatic use of typography, including some verticals and some interesting fonts. And it immediately presents itself and you go in a second, this is not what you typically see in the internet and things that I thought were images were not and good use of CSS. And I started to wonder what's going on here. And then you start scrolling down and there's a picture of a cat, which we've seen before. And then there's some, some bits and you're encouraged to manipulate the bits, and then the the JPEG is encoded and decoded like live. I thought I was going to like hurt my machine or corrupt it or something. Like I was going to like changing one byte in a in a JPEG was going to ruin things, but it didn't really ruin it. Yeah, so that's a challenge with something like this: is how do you make it so that the interactions are accessible for people and so that they're not you know, scared to mess anything up. And Mm -hmm. we tried really hard to think about different ways of how to do that. uh, But, you know, providing kind of good error messages and feedback, if you do corrupt the image, uh, quote unquote, corrupt, um, Mm -hmm. and there's a very clear reset button that can always take you right back to the start. But we also added links in line with the text. So if you click on particular sections of the text, Omar uh, suggests these particular configurations of the bits that you can just click on and it will set itself in that configuration. You can kind of learn, okay, here's, you know, just changing this one number, here's what happens and you get this interesting output. Now maybe I'll try something myself and see, you know, what, what do these other configurations do? There was so much about this article and this level of interactivity that worked. And I think that that point that you just made, that it's one thing to have some pros and then have a bit of, a bit of interactivity and then have some pros. But 
he literally in the middle of a sentence says, you know, it's interesting that changing some numbers doesn't impact the image while link setting uh, this number to 17 on line one ruins the image. And then you click on it and then it does exactly what it says it was going to do. You built interactivity between the pros and the, the island of, of interactivity. Exactly. And that's something that I, I think can be really powerful is tying text to the actual graphics on the page. Um, and it's something, unfortunately, we don't see too often because you, if you think about how would you do that in a site uh, built on WordPress or Medium, for example, it just may not be possible unless you're really diving into the low level under, underlying HTML and JavaScript. Mm-hmm. Which brings me to a really interesting question, not to like, you know, impugn the entire internet here, because we all appreciate uh, well, I don't necessarily appreciate Medium, but I appreciate the idea of free and easy publishing. Um, and I appreciate that WordPress has become the operating system that the internet seems to run on. But, um, you know, and I grew up on, you know, GeoCities and uh, LiveJournal and things like that, where we were hacking in MySpace by just editing the HTML. Now we want to be able to just slap the keyboard and make things work. These websites like WordPress and Medium have really kept us from making articles like what you have at Parametric Press. It's prevented us from creating this level of interactivity. Absolutely. I mean, I think you take the good with the bad because, you know, WordPress and other blogging platforms, really, they do give people a voice to publish to a large audience that they wouldn't have otherwise. But Mm. they're kind of, they're these golden handcuffs in a way as well because, right, you're not getting able to manipulate the underlying code or add the custom design that you want to. So we think of parametric press as kind of pushing back against that. Um, And so the whole issue of the parametric press is open source. So we're kind of trying to provide not only a really great publication, but also kind of a model for other people to to follow as well. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that 10, 20 years ago, we were promised an interactive internet? And by that, I mean, not just books, copied in their static prose to the internet. But I seem to remember in the early days with things like Java applets, we were promised an interactive internet and it just all stopped one day. I think it goes back even even further than that. Uh, so one of my big inspirations for this project is Alan Kay and his Dyna book. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, there, I don't think there's any easy answer. For one, I think that uh, Publishing interactive content like this is is really hard. I mean, it took a team of people with sort of different backgrounds, like designers, writers, programmers, uh, editors, all coming together to be able to to make this happen. Um, but also, if you think about uh, just the the funding model of the internet and how publishing works, uh, it's it's not always in publishers' best interest to spend so much time creating the, the content like this. And, and if you have a new medium like the internet where people don't really know what the possibilities are, uh, maybe the audience isn't asking uh, for quite as much uh, because they don't even know that it's possible. Mm-hmm. That idea that people don't know it's possible is interesting because it's been so long since the internet was like this. Uh, it's been many, many years where it became a, a largely static thing. And I do realize that I'm making some um, broad generalizations here, that there's a whole generation of people who are, are surprised when someone utilizes, you know, scrolling in an unusual way to do an infinite scroll or a horizontal scroll, or when the New York Times or 538 does a visualization and someone goes, oh my goodness, how did that, how did that do that? So it's become the, uh, the exception rather than the rule. Right. I mean, so I grew up uh, in the generation. So my first social network that I was on was MySpace. Mm. Um, and I really loved that just to be able to uh, customize the design of my page, for example. And uh, then I remember moving to Facebook and you couldn't do any of that, which which felt really frustrating, even though the, the design was clean and all my friends were on it. Right. Um, but I, I kind of have always felt like there were, there were these two internets existing at the same time. Like there was the internet of the big publishers. So there's the New York Times and CNN websites and things mm-hmm. like this. Um, but then there's also this other internet where people are just having fun and making their own web pages and making their own content. Um, and so I've always kind of identified with that that second group, but I don't think that it has to remain so sort of small and niche. I think that as publishing tools become more powerful, hopefully we can bring some of these ideas uh, to more of the mainstream. 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes people point to Star Trek as the time when we thought that interactive graphics and interactive movement and things like "quote unquote" iPad would be uh, would 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 be, were conceived of. But but you you point to Alan Kay, who developed the Dyna book in the late '60s, early uh, '70s when he was doing his PhD, as being your inspiration. Did you think about Star Trek or iPads and things like that while you were doing this work? So I didn't think about Star Trek. Um, one thing that I did think about was the uh, illustrated primer. I mm. uh, you know that from, uh, I think it's Neil Stevenson's book. Uh, the I forget the exact title. It's the ladies, the ladies guide, the young ladies illustrated primer guide where uh-huh. uh, she's given this book, which is uh, kind of this interactive tutoring system. And the book is kind of an artificial intelligence and it learns with you and it it can modify what it's telling you based on how you're doing and based on what your interests are. And so that was something that was uh, really eye-opening to me when I first read that because it was, uh, I think that book was written in the the early nineties. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's something that's like, oh yeah, we should definitely have this. Why, why don't we? And why isn't there anybody that I can, that I can find who's even like working on this or talking about this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that book is The Diamond Age, A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer by Neil Stevenson, part of a, his kind of post-cyberpunk uh, style of writing. Um, it, these, all of these things, whether it be Dynabook or the Apple Newton or I think about HyperCard, were all a promise of easy interactivity. And, they, and then the, during the rise of JavaScript in the last few years, uh, as well as early days with Java on applets, it seemed like the barrier to entry to create an uh, interactive visualization kind of got higher and higher to like only programmers could do such a thing, not not publishers or not people who want to just simply present information in an interactive way. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think we're seeing that some with web development in general. Like if you look at discussions that are happening, for example, in the React community right now mm-hmm. with like you know, there's these really, really powerful tools and build systems like React that allow you to make web applications that are, you know, well-engineered and well-structured. Um, but the, the cost that you have for that is that a beginner coming into these things that just can't wrap their head around why they're all necessary, right? And even if you you know that at the end of the day, it's just a HTML and JavaScript, so why do we need all of these other things? Mm. Uh, I think there's uh, maybe something similar in the... Um, area of data visualization. I mean, I think that D3 has, has and Mike Bostock has, have really done a great job in terms of uh, making that accessible to more people. I mean, just the sheer number of examples and open source code that he's posted on the internet, I think has, has been a huge inspiration and boon to that community for sure. Yeah, definitely. I was going to bring up Mike Bostock, his kind of seminal article uh, on a better way to code, bringing the idea of like a Jupyter notebook to integrated discovery of data. He has a, a great quote in there called uh, per Ben Schneiderman that says, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. And interactivity adds a dimension to pictures that allows you to get that insight, I think. I think that's right. It's this whole other dimension that uh, maybe we haven't thought about before when we're focused more on kind of just the graphic design of visualizations and thinking about how they're laid out on the page. Um, as a designer, when you realize that there's this whole other tool that you have, which is motion and responsiveness, um, mm-hmm. there, there are uh, just tons of interesting uh, capabilities that open up. Sick of waiting for your CI tests to pass or having to manage different CI servers for different teams? Using BuildKite, you can run fast and reliable CI pipelines for every type of project. Whether it's back-end tests, mobile apps, or even custom hardware, BuildKite's agent helps you scale to thousands of parallel jobs, and your secrets and source code never leave your infrastructure. There's great documentation, a clean web UI, and plugins for different types of tools. Visit BuildKite, that's K-I-T-E, dot com slash Hanselman for a 14-day free trial and see how Shopify scaled from 300 to 1,500 engineers while keeping their build times under five minutes. That's buildkite.com slash Hanselman. How did this work? You have you are the, the, the editor-in-chief of Parametric Press. Do you go looking for someone like Omar and then you work together co- cooperatively? Or do you did he come to you? How do you how did that happen? Yeah, so Parametric Press started just as an idea that I had, and I kind of recruited a few friends of mine to work on it. So another editor that uh, was on board for this issue was Fred Homan, who's a PhD student at Georgia Tech. 
um, and our collaborator, Sarah Stala, who is one of the editors mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, the text. Um, we wrote out a call for proposals um, and we sort of built up this idea by just like writing out, okay, here's what we want the thing to look like. Um, and we sent it to all of our friends and they gave us feedback and we kind of refined it and refined it until we had something that like really captured the idea we were trying to get at. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, we sent it to uh, Andrew Odewan, who's the CTO of O'Reilly, and he gave us a little bit of money to create the first issue. So thanks a lot, Andrew, for making that happen at O'Reilly mm -hmm. Media. Mm -hmm. um, and once we had that secured, we put out this call for, for proposals online. We said, hey, if you're an author who's uh, interested in this kind of new way of storytelling that uh, utilizes visualization and interactive graphics, send in your proposal, uh, just an idea, a short paragraph, um, and we have some funds to pay you. And we have some people on board who are experts at the visualization side of things who can help out on the programming side of things. So we wanted to make sure that people who hadn't necessarily worked on uh, this style of content before wouldn't be scared off by trying to take it on. Um, and that was successful. And we got, uh, I think, about 35 submissions for uh, ultimately five spots. And so it, it was very competitive uh, for the first round, I think. Mm -hmm. but, Sounds like it couldn't have gone better, too. You hit it out of the park on the first try there. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, I, I was looking at this, and the first thing I did, of course, as a programmer is I went view source. And I started to figure out, like, oh, this is amazing. How did, how did this happen? I wanted to understand, was this an app? Like, was each page, was each article an app? But it appears that it's more than that. This is some kind of a document as part of a larger, a larger way of thinking about how to visualize things. It's part of a toolkit. That's right. So the whole issue is built on this open source project called Idle, which is an interactive publishing system that it, I've been working on for the past couple of years as part of my PhD research at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the uh, so what we wanted to do was, uh, you know, test out the system in a real a real world setting. So we wanted to mm -hmm. say, OK, we're going to do this live. We're going to make the best possible art, uh, issue that we can. Um, and we're also going to use that to understand what are the uh, failure points of the system, what needs improvement, and so on, so that we can sort of, in typical open source fashion, continue uh, improving everything in the open. Um, and so this was uh, one thing about the parametric press was that it was the first kind of multi-page uh, magazine that was built on the tool. So previously, we had seen people creating uh, you know, single page, what you would call explorable explanations or interactive essays using it, um, but never anything that kind of had its own style and design. And it was very cohesive across multiple pages. Mm -hmm. I'm looking up at IDLE, and I'm going to make sure that I include links to all of this in the show notes. Of course, it's spelled I-D-Y-L-L. -L. And in the gallery, there's an example that I think is particularly interesting when it shows you the difference between where's the prose, where's the visualization, and where's the componentry, because it really showcases the idea that this isn't meant for one person necessarily, but perhaps a way to reduce the amount of code required for collaboration between a researcher or a journalist and a programmer. And the example I'm thinking of is this card shuffling example, which is basically explaining, you know, when you shuffle a card, how does it really behave? Is there uh, what we think is intuitive is not necessarily how it works. And if you go and look at the code on GitHub, there is some, you know, there's some React. You can use D3. So like you can get to the low level, but if you look at the pros, Within the prose written in this idle markup language, it looks kind of more like markdown with some meaning than it does code. I don't even see any any JavaScript. You kept a nice um, separation of responsibilities. Thank you. Yeah, that's. I'm I'm glad you pointed that out because that was actually one of the big motivations for this project was thinking about um, you know how do you enable collaboration between people with different skills, whether they're uh, you know writers or, or technical people who are more on the programming side or designers who are interested in making things look good and feel nice. Um, and so this understanding that there needs to be both a separation of concerns, but the ability for people to collaborate kind of came out of a lot of the work that I did when I was at uh, 538. Um, mm -hmm. I was on the, the graphics desk there. And so I understood kind of how a newsroom works in that sense that 
there are people who have these really specialized skills and they, they have to all work together. And when you're uh, publishing interactive content, a lot of the tools don't acknowledge that. There's, there's tools that really help out one party or the other, but then mm -hmm. when you actually have to put the two together, it's a real struggle. And so you, you'll have, um, for example, maybe a, an HTML page with uh, something that a writer wrote put in has a has a typo in it mm -hmm. then how does an editor go and, and fix that do they go on github and like change this one thing do they have do they have to understand git just in order to add a comma to to the article mm. um, that seems like something that that is shouldn't be necessary right um, and so with idle the idea is that there's this markup which contains all of the text um, and there's the code which has the the kind of snippets of d3 or react or whatever and they're those are separate but they're tied together through these um I guess you would call them includes or component markup mm -hmm. that, that lives in the idle file. So you can kind of orchestrate uh, where things appear and how they look and what happens when someone reaches a certain section on the page or when someone clicks on something that's all done in the markup, but the actual implementation details of the graphics themselves are separate. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that was particularly clever about Fred Holman's uh, card shuffling example was that there's certainly like a bunch of pros and then there's an interactive thing with cards running around on the page. But in the middle of sentences in line, uh, referring to the cards and suits, it'll say something like, once the king of diamonds moves up one position, he's chosen rather than to spell out king of diamonds, he literally has a red K and a diamond very cleanly as if it's, it's as if it were a glyph mm -hmm. that the browser itself knew about. And I thought to myself, well, hang on a second. There's no, there's no king of diamonds glyph that is like a Unicode thing. How did he do that? There's a component within the code that's a React component that literally exists to visualize a card. It's only like 16 lines if you pull out white space and curly braces, and it takes care of saying that. So the, the author just says, just like they would with an equation with like math ML, they say, I want uh, a visualization that represents an inline card and suit. It's extremely clean and very, very clever. Thanks. Yeah. I think that there's something to be said to be able to kind of write things declaratively like this, where you, mm -hmm. you can really just say, I want this card representation here. I'm not going to worry about, you know, how, how the component is implemented and that that's something separate. But yeah, so I think Fred did a great job utilizing the the toolkit there and, and making a really nice article out of it. Mm -hmm. So is this something that like a New York Times or a 538 or one of the big visualization shops that everyone is impressed with would do? Or are they doing a lot of their things with D3.js uh, manually? Yeah, so most of the big media outlets today have invested a lot in infrastructure that, um, you know, doesn't look exactly like idle, but has a lot of uh, the same ideas behind it, which is kind of combining uh, text and prose and code in this way. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't expect that they would necessarily uh, adopt this project in the short term. I think that where I would expect it to have a bigger impact is at smaller media outlets that actually don't have the technical capacity to build this kind of thing on their own. Mm -hmm. um, so with Idle, they can say, okay, here's, you know, here's this project that allows us to uh, publish interactive articles in a well-structured way that has a lot of these design decisions already taken care of for us. Mm -hmm. So this could be integrated into someone else's existing publishing pipeline as well. If they did use WordPress, I presume that there would be a way that they could integrate this in without having to have the entire site's publishing workflow move to idle. That's right. Yeah. So it's designed so that you can either kind of use it wholesale, like use it to publish everything and kind of turn it into a CMS or do it uh, in a sort of a more piecemeal way where either you can embed idle snippets in articles or just create single idle articles and embed those in your, in your WordPress deployment or something. Mm -hmm. um, many years ago, uh, and a little bit still now, I was a big fan of Edward Tufte and everything that he had written. And I think a lot of us went to see Tufte live and receive his books on, you know, his, his books on the visual display of quantitative information. A lot of those uh, bits of uh, ways to present information is very static, though. Um, I, I, I know that his things were taught in school for print in newspapers and things, but where is the research and the work happening right now for doing these kind of things interactively? Yeah, so I think Tufty's great. I mean, I've learned a ton from from his 
writing and from his books. Um, but you're absolutely right that he's focused on print design more than interaction, right? And so there are uh, a few threads of research, I think, happening in this area now. Um, if you look at the, from the academic community, the IEEE Viz conference um, often has uh, very rigorous academic research that, that looks at how do you incorporate interaction into kind of data-driven storytelling in this way. Um, and going even, even further back, I think that um, interactivity has been incorporated into data analytics systems for a while now. Mm -hmm. um, looking at, for example, the work of Ben Schneiderman, who I think you, you mentioned briefly before. Um, but it's just more recently that we're thinking about um, the combination of data and visualization and interactivity in this more kind of storytelling capacity. Mm -hmm. When I tried to show uh, some of the things of Parametric, Parametric Press to my wife, who is highly educated and has more, more degrees than I do, but is not a techie, uh, she wasn't sure what was going to be interactive and wasn't what wasn't. And I tried to figure out why that was. What was it about the web that has taught her that most things on the web are flat and static, you know? She, I found it like, for example, looking at your article on particle physics, where you do things like how to uh, accelerate a particle using an electric field, and it's full of these interactive interfaces. Those were not immediately intuitive to me, and they are all new, in, independent, you know, little interaction moments, little applications of, you know, they would have been Java applets 20 years ago. How do you teach that to someone who's not intuitively a techie? To, to, to do that, to try to interact with that and, and feel comfortable with that. Right. Yeah. I think it's really interesting how we come to understand a medium like the internet. So if you, for example, came across this diagram in the context of a video game, for example, you would automatically assume that everything was interactive probably, mm, right? Exactly. But we've, been, we've been conditioned to think that uh, posts on the internet are, are typically static. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are, you know, there are a few ways uh, that we can sort of try to help uh, through different design cues inform people that there are these interactions that you can take. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one thing that, that we did, which may or may not have been successful in the first article uh, in Omar's piece was to include an animated GIF of someone interacting with the, the widget uh, before they actually got to it. So there's this, this animation that includes a mouse pointer that shows them highlighting text and manipulating it so that you had a little cue that, okay, later on in the article, you're going to get to be, uh, be able to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, something that Nikki Case uh, said, which we can probably learn from, is to make everything bouncy. Um, hmm. So if you think about, uh, if you have something on your page that can be clicked or can be manipulated, um, make it move a little bit, just subtly, so that uh, someone understands that, okay, this is, this is something more than just a, a static element on the page. That is a really great point. Anytime that anything, you know, just a little shimmy is enough for you to go and say, oh, that's a thing. Because, uh, you know, we, I was, I was, I remember reading somewhere that our brains are always looking in the peripheral vision for threats. So <laughs> things on the screen that wiggle cause the, some part of your brain to go, hmm, what? And then, oh, yeah. oh, squirrel. And then you want to go and mess with that. And I read an article recently saying that we also want constant um, feedback that things are going well. So it recommended that we put a ripple effect on all of our buttons because so many people click a button with their iPads or their touchscreens and they don't know if anything happened. And then they end up hitting the button twice. Uh, a simple ripple effect tells them that it did in fact get clicked. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of little design cues that can be incorporated to make sure that we're sending the right message to users that um, there's something available to be done. There's there's something happening in the background um, that that you're not just sitting and waiting for no reason and you have to click the button again. Um, so I, I love those those examples of kind of using psychology uh, in a way, in an applied way to make sure that people are getting the most out of your interfaces. Mm -hmm. Let me put you on the spot as we get ready to, the, to close here. What is your favorite visualization? What's an example that of one either that you did or the one that you saw where you just had to be like, oh my goodness, and you just rush, pick your laptop off and up and run down the hallway and say, look at this, look how they did that. That was amazing. There are many. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the work coming out of the uh, National Geographic recently has been mm. really, really impressive to me. Um, 
they've been doing some really cool things with with three D visuals, which we we rarely see done, and if if we do see them, they're rarely actually done well. Mm -hmm. um, so they've done some things with uh, showing uh, planets in the solar system, and even three uh, D models of dinosaur bones, and you can kind of play as a as a uh, archaeologist uh, looking at looking at these fossils. Um, I think beyond those, another one that. Uh, I really loved recently was this uh, tree ring graphic of immigrations, um, which was I'll, I'll I'll send you the link because I'm, I'm blanking on who it was, but it was it was just it was just a beautiful combination of aesthetics and information, and it was kind of a masterclass of, of that. Was that the National Geographic 200 Years of U.S. Immigration? Looks like the rings that, in the tree. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. These kind of things are really, really significant because they're taking something organic and then aligning it with something organic that we intuitively know. You know, we know, uh, as we learn as small children, how the rings of a tree express generations. So what a clever way to take what could be a boring radial graph and make it feel organic. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of piggybacking on people's existing understandings of how trees work and using it as a metaphor, I think was was really brilliant there. Yeah, that's fantastic. I will be sure to include links to that. And uh, people can go and explore natgeo.com, which is full of great stuff like this all throughout. Uh, some of the best work in visualization, as well as the work that happened, as you mentioned, on uh, 538 that you were associated with as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you chatting with me today, Matthew Conlon. It's been great. Thanks so much for having me. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 